Thank you for watching our recorded webinar, Magnetic Flow Meter Basics for the Water and Wastewater Industries. Our presenter is Jack Rauschy, Product Marketing Manager with Siemens Process Instrumentation. Jack will share with you best practices of using magnetic flow meters for water and wastewater treatment applications. In this session, he'll cover principles of magnetic flow meter operations, some common applications, verification tools, installation and operation do's and don'ts, and question and answer. With 40 years of experience in the process measurement and instrumentation industry, Jack has held roles in product marketing, sales management, and sales support. At Siemens, he's responsible for all strategic development, product marketing, and product management issues associated with magnetic flow products. He brings with him a wealth of instrumentation knowledge and extensive flow experience. With that, I'll turn it over to Jack. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning and or afternoon, depending on where you're located. Um, thanks for the opportunity to give this presentation on uh, mag meters. As, we, as I was introduced, uh, we're going to look at uh, how a mag meter works. Uh, we're going to look at uh, where it can be used, where it can't be used, and then uh, spend a little bit of time going into why there are various different versions of what seems to be the uh, the same product, so you maybe get a better understanding of uh, of why you've got choices between one type of flow meter versus another, even within the mag meter family. There we go. Just a quick commercial before we get started. Uh, Siemens is a full line process instrumentation manufacturer with products and pressure temperature uh, level and flow, flow technologies along with mag meters including uh, ultrasonic both inline and clamp-on type products, Coriolis and Vortex meters. Again, I'm going to run through a quick uh, introduction of the product family, talk about how a mag meter works, uh, talk about how it's constructed, uh, what are the parts that are critical, um, that sort of thing, the stuff that you never see because it's hidden behind the, uh, the secret door. We'll look at some typical installation and some various product designs. So this is basically the family of products that we're going to be talking about today. As you can see, there's a variety of different sensors associated with the MagMeter product line, and also there are choices in the different types of transmitters or as some customers and or manufacturers refer to them, converters, because technically that's what it's doing. It's converting the raw signal that comes out of the mag meter into a signal that you can use uh, in your process uh, measurement or process control uh, environment within your, uh, within your facility. So right now we'll get into the technical aspects of it and talk about the science associated with mag meters. Mag meters are, uh, operate based on Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. Uh, this looks very complicated, but I'm going to simplify it because I'm not an engineer, so simple is what I do best. Basically, if you look in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see the concept of Faraday's Law. Faraday's Law basically says that if you have a conductive material, in this case represented by a magnet, uh, passing through a magnetic field, uh, it will create a voltage and that voltage will be directly proportional to the velocity of the material going through it. So if now if you look to the left, uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see this is a typical mag meter in operation. So you've got the magnetic field that's created, and then you've got the conductive material passing through it. Now what's interesting to note about a mag meter is that it doesn't matter what the conductivity of the material is going through the meter as long as it meets the minimum threshold, which is traditionally for most mag meters, five microsiemens per centimeter. So as long as your conductivity is at that level or higher, the meter is going to work, and if the conductivity changes, it doesn't matter. The only thing that changes uh, the voltage is the velocity going through of the conductive material going through the magnetic field. What the change in conductivity does is simply uh, increase or decrease the strength of that signal. So 
again, what we're concerned about is measuring the velocity. And of course, if you take velocity and you have a known area, and because these are in uh, these are inline meters, so we have a fixed diameter of our tube, uh, we can convert velocity to volumetric flow rate. So, at the end of the day, we don't care what the density is, we don't care what the viscosity is, and we don't care what the conductivity is, of course, assuming the conductivity meets the minimum threshold. Okay, so we're past the science, now we can move on. So what is conductive material uh, and how does it work? Well, let me start off by saying what isn't conductive, very simply, uh, or not conductive enough, and that would be gas and steam. So this is not a technology to be used in gas and steam applications. It is a liquid flow meter. Now that having been said, it's a very flexible liquid flow meter uh, in that it can have solids, it can have slurries, uh, it can have all kinds of different things. It, it can even have a certain amount of entrained air in the liquid and still operate uh, perfectly well. If you look at your typical application, since we're dealing with water and wastewater here, tap water, for example, has a conductivity of 80. As an, as, and as I mentioned, uh, we're talking about the need to measure five microsiemens per centimeter or higher, and tap water is sitting at 80. You get into the wastewater side of things, and in most cases, the materials that uh, that are in wastewater actually will raise the conductivity of the material up to where you'll get conductivity upwards of uh, upwards of 100 to a, even 1,000 uh, microsiemens per centimeter. And uh, so again, for the applications that we're dealing with specifically here today, we're not going to be concerned with conductivity because anything water-based that's used in a uh, water treatment facility or a wastewater treatment facility is going to work just fine with a mag meter. And that's why mag meters by far are the, uh, are the single most popular flow measurement technology used in water and wastewater applications. Now, if you fall outside that, if you get into chemical, uh, food and beverage, that sort of thing, uh, a lot of your materials going through industrial applications are also conductive enough in order to be able to be used with a mag meter. So if you look at the at the, the list on the left, uh, that's a list of different things, be it in uh, municipal or industrial applications, that will work just fine with a mag meter because they have plenty of conductivity. The materials on the right, uh, they do not have enough conductivity on their own. Now I mentioned the non-conductive just because one of the things that you may find in a water treatment facility uh, depending on where that where the feed water is coming from that's, that's being treated, is you may wind up with materials that are non-conductive uh, being suspended in the carrier water. So from a measurement perspective, they're going to work just fine. However, if that material falls out and starts to coat the mag meter itself, it could build up a non-conductive coating, and I'll show you how that could happen uh, as we get into the next couple of slides. So what we normally recommend is that if you know you're going to have a coating uh, issue uh, because of the type of material that's, that's suspended in the water, uh, that you keep the velocity up a little bit, uh, and that does two things. One, it tends to want to keep the material in suspension so the material will not fall out, and secondly, if you get a little bit of a higher velocity, let's say 10, 12 feet per second of velocity going through the mag meter, it will tend to create a self-cleaning type of environment where the water will actually work to help keep the, uh, the liner and the electrodes, and I'll talk about liner and electrodes in just a moment, uh, but it will keep them clear of any buildup of non-conductive material. So this is the basics of a mag meter. This is a cross section. Uh, and what you see is uh, in the top and the bottom of this. Let's see if I, there we go. So at the top and the bottom, you have the, mag, the magnets, which are creating the magnetic field. And on the sides here, you have the electrodes, uh, which are used to uh, interpret or to pick up the voltage created by the conductive material. 
So again, your magnetic coils create a field going in one direction, and then when the conductive material goes through, it's going through at 90 degrees, and it creates a voltage, and then that voltage is picked up by the measuring electrodes. So if we look at a meter in a non-cross-sectional format, the first thing you've got is you've got your, uh, your process pipe, if you will. Now I point this out because it's worth noting, and the reason I have the arrow pointing where it is, is the flange on almost all mag meters are, is going to be made of carbon steel. It's going to be an epoxy coated carbon steel. A lot of times I will get requests from customers saying I would like to have stainless steel flanges. Um, and I will tell you right now, regardless of who the manufacturer is, if you go to a stainless steel flange, two things are going to happen. Your price is going to jump up significantly, and your delivery is usually going to get pushed out significantly. And in both of those cases, it's going to make the customer uh, very unhappy uh, for obvious reasons. The reason why most manufacturers, or basically all manufacturers, don't uh, have stainless steel flange meters sitting on the shelf for quick delivery or offer uh, or have good prices on them is because the flange itself is not process wetted. Now if you look at the second part of this and that's the liner, uh, the liner basically extends through the tube. It's an insulating material made of some kind of rubber or Teflon or it can even be ceramic in some, uh, in some uh, very uh, aggressive chemical processes. But what all of those liners have in common is they are insulators. So what we're trying to do here, as I mentioned, you've got a conductive material going through a magnetic field and it creates a voltage. If the side of the pipe were conductive, if it were just straight stainless steel or something like that, then you would have a path for that voltage to go uh, that would be huge and basically that voltage would dissipate and it would disappear into that large conductive surface. By insulating the pipe, we now basically remove virtually all of the conductive surface that the voltage can travel to and we leave a path of least resistance electrodes that are mounted uh, 180 degrees away from each other on the sides of the, on the, sides of the tube. So now that voltage is going to take that path, it's going to find the path to the electrode, and that path is going to be where the voltage then goes up into the transmitter or the converter, where it's converted from a very low voltage signal that no process measurement or control operator is going to want to work with, and it turns that into your traditional 4 to 20 milliamps or Modbus or Profibus or Foundation Field Bus or whatever your protocol is, that you're looking to use to measure the flow rate that's going through the meter. Staying with the electrodes for just a moment, the, you may find in some mag meter designs, depending on what you get, you may also find some electrodes mounted along the bottom uh, of the pipe. Now when I say bottom, I'm talking about bottom relative to a horizontal installation like I'm showing you here. Uh, that would be a grounding electrode and the purpose of that is to basically provide you with an op a, a way to grab any stray voltages that may be part of the process coming down the process line build up from static electricity etc and getting rid of those so that the only thing being measured by the device is the voltage being created uh, by the uh, by by the magnetic field and the conductive liquid so grounding is very important and I'll talk about grounding of the of a mag meter later on it's not just a matter of properly grounding the transmitter because it's an electrical device. You actually have to ground the sensor itself so that again the voltage that's induced by the by Faraday's law is all that the meter is seeing so you get a good clean signal from the sensor up into the transmitter and then out into your into your process or control. So I mentioned there's two key parts. Uh, oh, I'm going to go back for just a second and point out one more thing. There's no obstructions and there's no moving parts in a mag meter. So basically, uh, I will get asked questions every once in a while, what's the pressure drop across my mag meter? Basically, the pressure drop across your mag meter is the same as, this, as that section of pipe would be. In many cases, it's actually less because the lined portion of the mag meter tube is probably slipperier 
and smoother than your pipe is, so the pressure drop would actually be less. So your pressure drop is, for all intents and purposes, negligible through the meter because of the fact that it's just a piece of pipe. There's also no moving parts, and what no moving parts does for you is it gives you a product that's very stable and will give good quality measurement for literally years and years uh, without the need to worry about swapping out parts where you might have bearings uh, that get worn out or other moving mechanical parts that need maintenance. So as far as maintenance are concerned, mag magmeters are one of the lowest maintenance type flow measurement devices that you're going to find. Okay. So again, there are two basic wetted parts that we worry about with a mag meter. One of them is a liner, and one of them is the electrode. Uh, there are a wide variety of liner materials that are available. Uh, different ones work well for different reasons. I will tell you right now that the, that the materials that we recommend the most uh, for water and wastewater applications are going to be ebonite, which is basically a hard rubber, uh, neoprene or soft rubber, or EPDM. Uh, those are the three materials that we put out there. Uh, they are very compatible with water and wastewater applications. Uh, they, in the case of all, uh, in the case of all three of them, have drinking water approvals, so they can be used on drinking water, and they're relatively low cost. So you, because you don't need an exotic material because you don't have high levels of chemical compatibility that you have to worry about. There's no reason that you can't go with the relatively low cost and economical design. But I am going to touch on all of these different liner materials uh, very quickly so that you have an idea of what they're, where they work and, and, uh, and why we have, uh, instead of just one or two liners, we actually have, what, eight of them here. So um, one, two, three, four, five, nine of them here. Uh, so I will touch on those very quickly. So if we look at ebonite, uh, ebonite for water and wastewater is going to be the, uh, the, the one that, that Siemens recommends in most cases. Uh, you may not find that every manufacturer has ebonite specifically, but most manufacturers do have some sort of a hard rubber. Uh, the advantage of hard rubber versus soft rubber is hard rubber will tend to be, have a little bit better uh, temperature range. It will also tend to be a little more chemical resistant than soft rubber. The advantage that a soft rubber will have is that because it's soft, if you do have a process where you've got uh, grit or some other kind of abrasive material in there, so if you've got grit or sand or something like that, soft rubber will tend to ha allow that material to bounce off of it, whereas the harder the material, the more likely it is to wear. I know that may sound uh, a little contradictory, uh, but that's the truth. That You tend to get more wear from a harder material than from a softer elastic type material like soft rubber. So again, ebonite is going to be a material that, uh, that we will certainly recommend on the lion's share of, uh, of our water and wastewater meters, uh, simply because of the fact that it does have good chemical resistance, uh, it, does have good, uh, it, it does have a good temperature limit, and it does have drinking water approvals. Soft rubber, again, will work nicely in applications where you've got abrasive. It's also a very good material for wastewater. Um, drinking water, again, the hard rubber is probably a little bit better material for drinking water um, overall, but it does have drinking water approval, so that shouldn't be a problem. And again, a little bit less of a temperature limit than you'll find with a hard rubber liner. EPDM um, is actually a very good material for drinking water applications. Uh, it's one of the ones that we standardize on on one of our water meters. Uh, we have a battery-powered mag meter, which I will touch on later on, uh, that's used specifically in, um, in water metering, so uh, sometimes residential, but uh, a lot of times it's commercial, but it's basically monitoring just like your home water meter monitors the drinking water going into your house. Uh, our meter measures the drinking water that's going into a building, uh, be it residential or commercial. Uh, so it's an excellent material with, uh, as far as drinking water capability is concerned. PFA is uh, a type of, basically a type of Teflon. Um, it is used in food applications uh, pretty regularly. It's also used in commercial or industrial applications. 
toxins because of its chemical resistivity. Uh, the reason we use it in food is because it, uh, it doesn't leach, so there's no worry about any material getting into or contaminating uh, food processing products. It has a good range of temperatures, which means it can be steam cleaned, uh, even at high temperatures of uh, 300 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's very flexible in that design while still being uh, uh, will st while still being a good solution from a, from a ruggedness and also from a flexibility standpoint for the application. PTFE uh, is Teflon. Now the difference between this liner and the rest of the liners that I've showed you is, first of all, it's the most chemically resistive one. However, uh, our, the rest of the liners that I showed you are, are all sp what we call spun in liners. They're basically uh, uh, applied not unlike you would you know, apply paint. Uh, it's basically they're they're spun in. They build up uh, as you you spray them on or or um, uh, or, or put them into the uh, liner and uh, and they build up and then they become very. They basically become one with the wall of the tube, uh, and because of that, they can handle uh, vacuum applications. For example, PTFE is more of an extruded type liner. What they basically do is stretch. The liner, it's, it comes as a tube, it gets stretched, uh, the tube diameter is bigger than the diameter of the pipe it's going in. It gets stretched, it gets put into the tube, and then it expands back. Teflon, uh, PTFE likes to find its way back to its original shape, so it will try to get back to its original size, and that's how it holds against the side of the wall. However, if you do have uh, a vacuum, either vacuum uh, as, far, as far as your process is concerned, or if you're using um, a steam cleaning or a CIP process, an industrial application, for example, and you pull a vacuum to, re to pull that material out, uh, that vacuum can pull the liner away from the tube wall. So we're very careful about this liner with Teflon, uh, with Teflon liner with uh, vacuum applications, uh, but it is a very chemically resistive material. Uh, we do sell a lot of them into industrial applications. Uh, this one I'm just going to touch on briefly, it's ceramic. We basically use ceramic just for uh, our food and beverage uh, type meter. Um, it is basically designed for the for really rugged applications. So it can be in use in, in industrial applications. It's used in food and beverage, um, but it is a very uh, abrasion and corrosion resistant type of design. So it works very well in the, in the nastiest of environments. It tends to be limited in size. Uh, normally to no more than four, maybe six inch, depending on the manufacturer, uh, but it does provide a lot of flexibility from an application standpoint. NBR is just another type of rubber. It's a natural rubber, uh, and it is used also for water and wastewater applications. It's not sold very often. It's more of a specialty product, uh, but uh, if you do have um, uh, an application that, uh, that may suit itself best, we do offer it as, a, as an optional material. Linotex is another soft rubber material, again, a specialized material really designed just for the most abrasive of materials. It doesn't have drinking water approval, so it's really not used in water or wastewater applications. And Novolock is, again, uh, that's more like a, uh, that's more like a, a, a like an, an epoxy type coating. Uh, that we spray into the, uh, to the liner, and again, it's got a specialized use to it. So I just brought it up there so you would know. So at the end of the day, what do you do with nine liner materials? Uh, you look at the applications, uh, and, if, and this is the type of material that we can provide you, and basically we can tell you whether it's a good choice, a better choice, or a best choice for your particular application. Uh, be it temperature related, be it abrasion related, be it process compatibility related. So we basically put together a, a host of materials so that if there's a conductive me medium that needs to be measured, uh, there's a liner material that can uh, that can stand up to the operating conditions and uh, and and can work as well as possible in in the uh, in the application. The other wetted part, as I mentioned earlier, is the liner. Liner is, uh, is basically one of five different materials. The most common material is going to be Hasseloy, Hasseloy C, actually. But we also offer stainless steel, uh, titanium, tantalum, and platinum, and let me cover them very quickly as to why you would have one versus the other. 
Uh, stainless steel, you would think, might be the most popular, and it, a lot of times stainless steel is specified, but truth be told, stainless steel and Hasselois C are, uh, are usually going to be priced very similarly to each other, um, almost identical in a lot of cases. In fact, for most manufacturers, Hasselois C will actually be the standard material that they offer. Uh, what I basically have experienced over the last 35 or 40 years with mag meters is there are customers out there um, who will have a Hasselhoi C preference and if you tell them you have stainless they'll tell you that they can't use stainless in the application uh, but I don't we ever recall an application where I went to a customer and said we have Hasselhoi C on the shelf uh, you've specified stainless steel and that they haven't been able to make the change over. So stainless steel is available. We actually do standardize on it on, on some of our low-end, uh, lower-cost meters, uh, specifically that are just handling, designed to handle water. But in most cases, we go to a Hasselhoi C because Hasselhoi C has a better corrosion resistance uh, than stainless steel. It has, it's a better choice for things like uh, salt water and brine. And again, in almost all cases, the customers that I've talked to have had no problem using Hasselhoi C when they may have specified stainless steel, but I have seen problems in the other direction. When you go into uh, more chemically resistive type things where you need something that will hold up uh, in a nastier environment than, better than Hasselhoi C or stainless steel, uh, then we go to the, the choices of titanium tantalum or platinum. Now titanium is um, a fairly resistive material. It's, it's better than Hasselhoi C in a lot of cases. Uh, it still has good abrasion resistance, so it tends to be the third choice that customers will go to. It'll be uh, after Hasselhoi, then stainless, then titanium. When you go to tantalum, it's because they have a very nasty environment and they really want something that's going to stand up to the uh, process. And then if they've got something that nothing else will stand up to, then they'll go to platinum. Platinum is almost across the board uh, a material that will hold up to virtually any chemical, which is why we pair up platinum with our ceramic meter automatically. When you get a ceramic meter from us, it automatically has, has a platinum electrode uh, because of the fact that it's usually for a high chemical resistive application and platinum is going to be the material that matches up the best with it from a chemical resistance point of view. So just like we did with the liner, we have all kinds of different applications uh, and we give them one or two or three stars or if you get down into the and into the bottom section and you'll you'll find there's a variety of different um, there's a variety of different corrosion guides uh, that you'll find out there. Uh, and some materials are, um, are, are, sometimes you get materials that are listed better by one corrosion guide than another. Uh, here's what I'll say about corrosion guides. You have to be careful when you're looking, for example, at something like a compass corrosion guide, which is fairly standard. Because what they're looking at is they're looking at pipe. So you're looking at something with a fairly good amount of metal associated with it. Uh, so if you, if, if you look at the electrode, you'll see the amount of material on the electrode uh, is not nearly as thick as a piece of pipe would be. So it is possible that you will get somebody's, uh, you'll, you'll talk to a mag meter manufacturer and they may say, well, we don't recommend this material for this application. And you may have looked it up on a corrosion guide and said, hey, it looked like it was going to work just fine. Uh, but then again, you have to remember that the pipe has got a lot more material attached to it than the electrode does. And as such, in order to make sure that we give you the best life we can out of our meters, uh, we may say that, look, it, you may think Hasselhoi C is okay, but we think you should look at titanium uh, or tantalum uh, simply because um, you know, we know that Hasselhoi C is going to, it's going to be, have a shortened life compared to those materials, and we really want to give you a meter that's going to hold up for as long as possible in the application that you've got. So that's materials of construction. Now, as important as the materials of construction are, uh, what's as important is how you install the meter. 
And there's two things that are associated with installing the meter that you have to keep in mind. The first and foremost is the pipe needs to be full, and it needs to be full of liquid. Um, if you are, if you mount it in a couple of, of a couple of ways, you're going to find that it lends itself to not having a full pipe. As I said at the very beginning, this is a velocity meter, uh, and it, as long as the electrodes, which are about halfway up the meter body, are covered, it's going to it's, it's going to interpret that as a, a good a good application, and it's going to measure the velocity and not give you any kind of an error message, and it'll tell you that it's flowing at let's say 10 feet per second. Now, if your pipe is full, 10 feet per second may equal 50 gallons per minute. If your pipe is just above the midpoint and covering the electrodes, but above that there's no liquid, it's still going to say 10 feet per second, but that 10 feet per second may only be 27 gallons per minute instead of 50. So it's important that the pipe be full. The ideal way to mount a mag meter is vertical with the flow going up. That way, as long as it's flowing, the pipe is going to be full. However, we recognize that it doesn't always have the luxury of mounting the meter vertical up. So if that's the case, the first choice would be to have some kind of an angle on the meter to try to keep the pipe full, like you see in the upper left-hand corner here. But what we really want to make sure that you're doing is that you want, we want to make sure that they're above uh, the downstream of the meter there's going to be something that kind of encourages the pipe to remain full at the meter itself. And that's what you see at the one at the bottom. If you mounted it at the top of the process line, uh, there it could be just basically draining out and you could wind up with uh, non-liquid gaps uh, in your measurement. If you mount it at a lower point uh, where the flow is then going to go up somewhere downstream of where the meter is, uh, the odds are pretty good that the pipe is going to stay full as long as you actually have process flowing through it. Um, so that would be one of the things that we recommend. One of the things that we try to avoid at all costs is down is vertical with the flow going down. Uh, not that I haven't seen that work. I have. There are customers that have the meter mounted in a vert with the flow going in a vertical down position, and they and it does operate just fine. I'm just simply saying that if you're going to have a problem with keeping a pipe full. Having the flow vertical at going down is going to be the most chronic uh, occurrence of not having a full pipe uh, if you mount the meter that way. So that's what we recommend, if at all possible, that you do not mount the meter vertical down. So that's, in, that's general installations. Now, of course, we're not going to keep it that simple for you. Uh, so another thing that we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about straight runs of pipe. Now, the reason we're talking about straight runs of pipe is, again, we're talking about a velocity meter here. So if you want to get the, the optimum performance out of a mag meter, which is upwards of about 0.2% accuracy, which is actually very, very good uh, flow measurement accuracy, you want a profile going through the meter that effectively assures that the velocity being seen at the measuring electrode, which again is right smack dab in the middle of the pipe, uh, center, uh, center on the diameter of the pipe, we want to make sure that the flow profile going past that is basically uh, representative of the flow profile going through the meter as a whole. So if the electrodes see 10 feet per second, we'd like the, the entire flow going through the pipe or through the flow meter to be as close to 10 feet per second as possible. Anytime you're coming off of elbows, you're coming off of tees or that sort of thing, uh, you do put at risk the, uh, the fact that the velocity going past the electrode is noticeably different than the velocity, the, the overall velocity going through the pipe. And that will affect your performance. So what we basically say is in a traditional in installation with a tee or an elbow or something like that, if you've got five diameters of straight run pipe upstream of the flow sensor. And when I say the flow sensor, I mean the electrode. So the meter body of the mag meter is actually part of the overall five diameters that I just talked about. Uh, as long as you've got five diameters upstream from the electrode and three diameters downstream from the electrode, then you're going to get uh, a flow profile that we will say is consistent with the accuracy statement of the meter. Now that doesn't always happen. What happens is a couple of things. I either get calls saying I don't have five up and three down, what can I do? 
or worse yet, I don't have any up or down. I have to mount this coming off of an elbow. I have to mount it going off. I have to have it flowing through and then going immediately into another elbow. What can you do for me? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is address the, I don't have my full eight diameters of straight run pipe. If you don't have eight diameters of straight run pipe, my recommendation is that you mount the meter so that you get as much upstream straight run as possible because that's where you're going to get the lion's share of your performance improvement which is why it's a longer distance to begin with so for example if you had six diameters instead of um, in, instead of uh, eight diameters my recommendation would be that you mount it with four upstream and two downstream uh, it's amazing how many times I've been out to customer sites and they've got straight runs of pipe and because of some reason that was decided upon by somebody, uh, they may, they put the meter right off of an elbow, uh, it came off of an elbow, goes through the meter and they're not getting the accuracy that they want. But they got plenty of downstream that they could have worked with if they had mounted it a little further down, it would have given them a better profile. So keep that in mind when you're looking at where you're going to install the meter. Always try to get more upstream than downstream if you don't have the full eight diameters available so that you get the best performance. If you're dealing with a control valve, either uh, either upstream or downstream, not a shutoff valve, but a control valve that might be partially open or partially closed, the diameters actually get more like 10 upstream and five downstream. And that's, that's very critical because it varies from valve type to valve type, so a butterfly versus a gate versus a, you know whatever. They're all going to have different effects, and at every time you're at a different opening one way or the other, it's going to have a different effect. That's the reason why we really want additional diameters with valves, and we're very insistent that we get those if you want to have a shot at really getting the performance out of the meter that you want. Now, if, if we're dealing with a shutoff valve that's either fully opened or fully closed, I actually, with a couple of my meters, have the ability to offer with 2% accuracy, not 0.2, but with a guaranteed 2% accuracy, uh, a zero upstream and downstream piping. So it can come right off an elbow, right off a T, uh, or right off a shutoff valve on either the upstream or the downstream or both sides and still operate properly. And I'll show you uh, how that plays out in just a minute. The other thing I talked about earlier was grounding. Now, grounding can be handled one of three different ways. Um, most commonly in municipal applications, water applications, it's done via the grounding ring. Uh, and that's just the nature of the beast. The applications are such that grounding rings are the best way to go. However, depending on your piping, you may not need grounding rings uh, or electrodes at all, uh, or you may need the full-blown grounding ring. And I'm going to touch on that really quickly right now. The reason why you would go to a grounding electrode would be to save cost. Uh, a grounding ring has got expense associated with it. It's installed between your flange and the flange of the meter, uh, so it costs to install it. Uh, it's a potential leak point. Um, and if you're getting into exotic material uh, electrodes, uh, you need to make sure that you don't have any kind of uh, galvanic reaction between the uh, material of the grounding ring or the and the material of the electrode. So if you go to a grounding electrode, that's going to be the same material as the measuring electrode and they're going to be perfectly compatible. Uh, that having been said, like I said, there's basically three installations that I've seen. Uh, one is if you've got a good metal pipe situation where you got metal to metal, you can actually ground the metering tube directly to the process flange and uh, and move on from there. Uh, you don't need anything additional. Now that assumes that you've got a good uh, connection uh, from, from that perspective between the two, so any stray voltages are, are basically negated out. If you're dealing with a grounding electrode, you, you basically would do the same thing, but the grounding electrode would take away the uh, stray currents. If you're dealing with plastic pipe or plastic lined pipe, uh, then you have a completely different scenario, and that is you've got a scenario where static electricity is going to be building up as the material flows through the pipeline and bounces off the walls. Static electricity builds up. There's no place for that static electricity to go. So when it gets into the metering tube, it goes right to the ground, uh, right to the electrode. The grounding electrode doesn't actually have enough surface area to pull it all away 
and that creates noise in your uh, in your mag meter and in some cases that noise can be more than uh, than can be tolerated to get a good output signal so in those cases you want to go to a grounding ring the grounding ring provides a surface area right before the meter and after the meter that pulls off static electricity keeps it away from the meter itself so that the only voltages that are being picked up by the measuring electrodes are the voltages that are being generated by the conductive liquid going through the magnetic field. So in other words, you get a good clean process signal. So um, I'm just going to touch on this briefly. There are chemical resistance charts. I've talked about this already. Uh, you need to make sure that your liner and your electrode material are both compatible with the process. If you're dealing with an acid or a base, you need to know two things. You need to know the concentration of the acid or base, and you also need to know the temperature. Most acids, for example, are going to be fine in the mid-range. So let's say 20% to 85% of the acid concentration. Usually you're going to have a fairly inert reaction with most of the liners and electrodes. When you get down to the very low end, say the 5 or 10% range, or you get up into the high end, 95 to 98%, then... Uh, you have to also take into account the temperature because they, the two of them in combination will have uh, potentially nasty effects, especially on the electrode materials if you get the wrong electrode material. So it is important that we have as much information on that as possible. Now we will, as a company, um, if you have a compatibility issue, we'll make suggestions on that. Uh, but ultimately, we want you as the customer to confirm that you're, ex that you're accepting of the materials that we've recommended because you know the process makeup. Uh, we can provide recommendations, but at the end of the day, it's your process and you've got to determine once in, you know, as a final determination whether it's compatible with the wetted materials that we're uh, proposing as part of our mag meter. Okay, so we have products for a wide range of, of, of um, different applications and different industries. Uh, this is just some of the applications. I won't spend a lot of time on this, uh, but here's a rundown of the different types of uh, materials that can be measured in all different kinds of industries. There's different mag meters for different applications. So there's a meter specifically designed for water and wastewater applications. It's basically designed to be a lower cost version uh, because it all, all it needs to hold up to is a water or a, a wastewater type of application, which is relatively very uh, relatively easy for a mag meter to withstand. Uh, if you get into industrial applications, now you need higher pressure ratings, you need higher temperature ratings, you need liners and electrodes for higher chemical resistive measures. And then there's specialty products like wafer style meters uh, that can be used for uh, chemical injection, for example, uh, or can be used for food and beverage applications. From a water wastewater perspective, you're going to find your line sizes usually run anywhere from one up to 80, maybe even even higher diameters, depending on uh, on what the application is, uh, how much water you've got coming in or out of your facility. Uh, you'll find that uh, you're dealing with rubber liners, uh, hard rubber or soft rubber liners. Uh, normally, Hassle C electrodes are going to be fine. Flanges are nominally going to be 150 pound. Very rarely in a water or wastewater application do I find the need to go anything higher than 150 pound flange. Uh, when we get into larger size meters, we go to the AWWA because uh, for municipal applications, uh, the AWWA flange is traditionally what we what we encounter when the diameter gets above two feet. Your accuracies can be 0.4 or even 0.2 percent. Uh, you can a standard enclosure for a sensor is going to be NEMA 4X. You can go to NEMA 6 6P. Uh, for submergence uh, or burial, if you need to bury it uh, in, in, a, in a vault or something like that. And the standard meter is going to be FM Class 1 Division 2 with a drinking water approval. You, uh, you can, uh, with another design, if you need to, go to explosion proof. But again, uh, water, wastewater applications, Class 1 Division 2 is normally sufficient. And because we know in water and wastewater applications, well, a lot of times we're going to encounter uh, unusual piping configurations compared to our standards, we do offer the ability to get a zero upstream and downstream with a 2% accuracy. For industrial applications, the size range is about the same. It goes a little bit smaller sometimes because the applications tend to, uh, in some cases, run to much smaller line sizes. There's a much wider range of liner and electrode materials and temperature ranges and pressure ranges because of the wide variety of applications. 
Uh, accuracy is traditionally going to be a 0.2% in the uh, industrial application, and the rest of it uh, is what I've already discussed, NEMA 4X or, or NEMA 6, 6P. In this case, in the industrial meter, we also offer a class one division one design uh, as an option uh, with class one division two being standard. When you get into wafer designs, you're talking about uh, smaller line sizes, anywhere down to a twelfth of an inch up to about four inch line sizes. Uh, we limit the liner and electrode materials simply because uh, we find that the uh, ceramic or PFA is more than acceptable uh, for the applications that we're looking at with platinum being tied to the ceramic liner, Hasselois C to the PFA. The rest of it is what we've talked about already as far as uh, accuracies, NEMA ratings, etc. And this would be the food and beverage version of that, and the difference being that it's designed with uh, 3A requirements, in the case of dairy, PMO requirements, that sort of thing. This is just a rundown of the various things I've already talked about, just a kind of a, a synopsis of sizes, temperature ranges, pressure ranges, materials of construction, ratings, that sort of thing. Along with the pressure trans, oh, I'm sorry, with, along with the sensor itself, you need to also talk about the transmitter. Uh, the transmitter's selection is going to be picked for a couple of reasons. Performance, do I need 0.4% or 0.2%? Uh, outputs, do I need something other than a 4 to 20 output? Do I need a mod bus or a profi bus or something like that? And third, uh, do I need the bells and whistles associated with a higher end electronics, higher levels of diagnostics, etc.? Uh, these on the right, the 6000i for industrial, are designed for the industrial market, and that would be the one you would go to if you needed an explosion proof class 1, division 1 design. I'm running a little long and I want to leave time for questions, so I'm going to plow through this pretty quickly. I've touched on most of this. One of the nice things about the Siemens design is that basically for the, all of the sensors that I've talked about so far, any of our transmitters will work. Uh, and basically the reason why they work is because they utilize what we call a sensor prom. When we calibrate the meter, we burn the, the instrument's performance information into a, uh, into a chip or what we call a sensor prom that goes with the sensor, that then gets plugged into the transmitter and all of the calibration information gets uploaded from that sensor into the transmitter. So if you need to change out the transmitter, you keep the sensor prom with the sensor and then all that information will get uploaded automatically. If you need to change out the sensor, you unplug the sensor prom from the transmitter, you put the new sensor prom into the transmitter and it will have the information on the new unit. All of our mag meters are NIST and ISO uh, certified. They come with calibration information automatically. Uh, if you ever need a calibration um, sheet and you can't find it, uh, all you have to do is give us a holler with the serial number of the unit and we can get you that information without a problem. Uh, you can actually get that information yourself from our website, but a lot of times it's easier just to call because we know where to find it, and you may have to. You may you may not want to be that searching through our website trying to find the right page. The uh, the uh, sensor problem I already talked about. The other thing that we do, which I think adds to our flexibility, is if you have a meter with four to twenty output and you want to add heart, you plug in a heart module. If you want to change it to Modbus, you take the heart module out, you plug in the Modbus module. Uh, you don't have to change out the electronics uh, if you want to upgrade your system from one communication protocol to another. Uh, that reduces the inventory you need to keep on the shelf and expands the flexibility uh, of your installed system if you're upgrading your, uh, your, your system to a, to a new protocol or something like that. The, other, the last thing I want to touch on, and then I'm going to just open it up for questions, uh, for basically for all of the sensors that we've talked about so far, we have what we call verification capability. And that's the ability, without removing the meter from the process line, to confirm the performance of the sensor by reading the sensor prom and also measuring how the meter itself is operating or the sensor itself is operating. We measure the, we, we check the transmitter for full functionality and we actually check the interconnect, interconnecting cable between the two so that at the end of the day, you know exactly uh, how your instrument is operating without the need to pull it out of the pipeline or, or even shut down the process. Uh, you keep in mind that it's not going to measure the process during this 15 minute test, uh, but you actually can keep process flowing through the pipe even if you need to. 
So it's a very flexible design. It works with our MAG 5000 and 6000 transmitters. It does not work with the 6000i, the industrial one that I showed you. Uh, but again, for water, wastewater, this is basically going to be the transmitters that you're going to be working with. The last meter I want to talk about is the one I alluded to earlier, and that is the meter, which is our 8000. This is a battery-powered meter, has no external power requirement. Uh, it basically registers the flow going through it, not unlike your house water meter does. In fact, you'll notice it has a very similar look to a house water meter. Uh, it runs off a lithium battery with a life of up to six years, and that's the internal battery. If you go to the external battery pack, it can actually extend the life of it for up to 10 years. Uh, if you in, are into uh, water metering, uh, it does have the uh, AMI, AMR capability uh, as well. So if you want to be able to do what your uh, local water uh, service does, and that is basically drive by the device, ping it, get a reading sent back, and then just continue moving on versus the old days where you had to go in and take a physical reading, uh, our meters are designed to do that. They also have, uh, they also have the, the GSM capability, which is basically the ability to use cell service to, to uh, relay the information that way. What's nice about our battery power designs, most manufacturers of either um, two-wire devices or battery power devices limit their line sizes to no more than 10 or 12 inch. Uh, we actually have the ability to operate a uh, battery power design up to and including 48 inch line sizes. So there's a lot of flexibility as far as being able to put this on larger line size meters uh, where power is not available. This is just a rundown of the materials of construction and the accuracies. Uh, the 8000i, the irrigation meter, uh, is designed specifically for uh, the irrigation market where accuracy is not as required. It's a, uh, it's a lower cost, uh, more simplified design that's basically designed for farm equipment or other irrigation equipment where they're monitoring the water that goes onto a field. Specialty product, which I'm only going to touch on very quickly, we do have what we call a transmag, which is, if you're familiar with mag meters at all, uh, back, in, uh, back in 100 years ago, they used to refer to these as AC mag meters. I won't go into the details between AC and DC, except to say that an AC mag meter has a stronger magnetic field, and because of that, it's less susceptible to noise from things like ore slurries or pulp, uh, paper pulp or that sort of thing, uh, and it can handle lower conductivities. Uh, but it really is not used in the lion's share of applications because today's standard mag meters uh, work in, I would say, 98% of the applications. This is basically to fill that gap on the last 2%. One of the beauties of the Siemens meter is that it can be buried uh, or it can be in a situation where it's going to be submerged in up to 30 feet of water. What I like about our design is the way it's done is through what we call call a submersion kit, which is a flexible potting material that gets basically added into the terminal box on top of the sensor. Uh, it basically watertight seals all of the components that are, uh, that are there, and then uh, that means that basically it's not going to see the water because the water's not going to get through it. The beauty of our design is if you decide that you need to uh, do this in the field after you've gotten the meter, uh, all you need to do is, is uh, mix up the potting kit, put it in, let it cure for 24 hours, and you're in business. Uh, most of our competitors, their, your choice is to have field tech come out and do it at the cost of a service call, uh, or worse yet, they can't do it at all, and you've got to get a meter that was specifically built that way out of the factory. So uh, I like the flexibility that we all offer in this. This is just very quickly a rundown. I talked about the 2% uh, capability with zero upstream and downstream. I uh, just wanted to point out on this that that's handled not by the fact that we tested it and said it could be done. We actually went to an outside agency uh, that confirmed our meter for custody transfer uh, accuracies, and they confirmed it with zero up and down and a 2% accuracy as well. So it is certified by an independent third-party testing agency. Jack, thank you very much for your presentation. If you have any specific application questions, feel free to give us a call at 800-9-LESSMAN. If you do not know your account manager, please feel free to ask for me, Mike DeLaCluse, and I'll make sure you get taken care of. You can also email me at Mike D, M -I -K -E -D, at lessman.com. Thank you very much for attending.